passage today is Acts chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Acts 2, 1 through 8. Let's pray. Father, we ask you now through the presence and power of your spirit to move among us as your word is read and proclaimed. Help us to listen with open hearts to what the spirit says. In Jesus' name, amen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? This is the word of God for the people of God. One of the most violent forces of nature is a tornado. I think we all would probably understand that. Uh, the sound of a tornado, uh, just like the sound we just heard going up the tracks here a minute ago, people equate the sound of a tornado like the sound of a freight train coming. Uh, back in the early 70s, I heard that sound out on the farm. A, a, a small tornado passed just south of our, of our house, uh, and I heard that sound. I'll never forget that sound. Well, on March the 2nd, 2012, um, a tornado hit the small southern Indiana town of Henryville. Henryville is on I-65, just north of Jeffersonville, New Albany, Louisville, that area. It was an EF-4 with winds clocked at about 175 miles per hour. Here's a little video clip uh, taken from a Shell gas station just off I-65 as the tornado passes by. Now there's a tornado just hitting Henryville. It just passed right in front. The, the gas station across the street was damaged. This shell station wasn't. But you see it, it's just blowing right into Henryville. Schools, school buildings were damaged, houses. Just it created this, this swath right through there. Now what's interesting is the United Methodist men in Sullivan County decided to go down there. And so Jenny and I and some others from the United Methodist Men's Group and some spouses went down to help in the restoration of Henryville. But the, the, the restoration was, had already kind of started to clean up. And uh, so this is taken from the hill uh, that, at that gas station. We stopped there to get gas as we were leaving Henryville when our time was done. But you just see that path through there. Now it was a month or so later, I think, that we were down there. And I see a lot of cleanup was uh, taken care of. These are just some shots of, of some houses, uh, buildings and things. Um, just devastation. We, uh, our group went out to a little town called Maryville, and it was uh, some, a few miles outside of Henryville. And as we all drove out, we were following the path of that. You could just see trees over it was just, it was, it was really eerie. Um, but having seen the aftermath of that storm, it, it really takes on a new perspective. And so today we're talking about the aftermath. The aftermath. We're dealing with this powerful storm that rolled through Henryville. And tornadoes have happened in the south, just it seems like one after the other the southern states are really getting hit with storms and things like that. So we're dealing with the power of the tornado and its effect on people's lives. Now, today is Pentecost Sunday, 
And so just a little education here. Pentecost means 50th. 50th. The Feast of Pentecost was an Old Testament festival that God instituted in the book of Exodus. And it was called the Festival of the Harvest, the Festival of the First Fruits. And it's really interesting that what happened happened on that day. But it, has been, it was 50 days after the Passover. So it's been 50 days since Easter. And this, um, this festival is the, the topic of our, of our message today. And so you're probably asking, well now what's the connection between tornadoes and Pentecost? Well I'm glad you asked that because the, the text tells us that gathered in that upper room there were 120 people. The, the 12 disciples, they had replaced Judas by this time, Mary the mother of Jesus, and 107 other people. And remember last week we talked about the ascension and how Jesus said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I want you to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So 10 days had elapsed and here they were in this upper room and they believe it was the same upper room where the Last Supper took place, that the, the group was gathering and praying. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they, they sound, Luke says, like a rushing wind. It was not a wind, but it was a, a sound that the Holy Spirit created as the Spirit came in that day. Uh, a visual presence. It looked like tongues of fire settling over each person. And if you, if you think about our cross and flame, if you look on the front of your bulletin, the cross and flame, the flame for the United Methodist Church represents this event, the flames of Pentecost. But it looked like flame. It wasn't actual flames, but it looked like it. And what's interesting is that the Spirit touched each person at the same time. Now, what was the aftermath of that? Well, the text tells us that they began to speak in other languages. Now, what's interesting, there, there's confusion over this because some denominations refer to uh, the fact if you're, you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you have to speak in tongues for this to happen. Now, what they're referring to is an ecstatic, unintelligible uttering that no one around you can understand and they're referencing this day. But that is not the case because what the text tells us is that they were able to speak in another language that they didn't know before. It would be like me all of a sudden being able to speak German fluently, never took German at all, and that, uh, that people could understand. And that's what they were doing that day. They, were, they, they didn't know the languages they were speaking, and visitors from Jerusalem, coming into Jerusalem, were able to understand them. Now the purpose of this was to get the attention of the non-believers in the community. And they were communicating with them in a way that they could understand. It's like, wow, I know what they're saying. So Pentecost is not about a style of worship or a denomination. It is about the aftermath of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. So, so what happened that day? What was the aftermath of the coming of the Holy Spirit? You see, the, the Holy Spirit changed these disciples' lives. Now think back to Easter. Remember where those disciples were on that first Easter? They were in a locked room, scared to death. And now here they are, they've, they've spilled out of this room, out of this building, and they're now boldly talking to people that they don't know. And Peter, Peter stands up and gives a sermon. Peter, who denied Jesus three times the night he was arrested, was also hiding in that upper room. And here he is boldly telling these people about Jesus. And he even says a little later on, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's pointing a finger at him. And it, it, it convicted him. Remember they said, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. So here he is speaking boldly. 3,000 people accepted Jesus that day. 3,000 people. People's lives were transformed. They started living differently. They obeyed the teaching of Jesus. So you see, it's the aftermath that's important. 
the transformation that happened, not the experience. Experience is okay. Experience in worship is good, but it must lead to something, something that builds the kingdom of God. Now, Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church that they, they identify that moment, that day, as the beginning of the church. And the church has been in existence some almost 2,000 years since that time. We, we owe our spiritual lives and our journey to a church. In fact, you can't be a Christian and not be part of a church. The New Testament is written for the church to edify and build them up. So our task is to remain faithful, to continue God's work, in this place. That work that was that began that day in Jerusalem. The work that has continued down through these centuries to now. The work that has been in this church since 1893 when it began. We, we continue in that unbroken movement of God's presence and power started that day and coming till now. We allow the Holy Spirit to continue to lead us in the ministry that God has started in this place. That we can owe things like Bible school coming up, Pentecost. People coming, Pentecost. It all has happened. Now, I, I realize that the work of the Holy Spirit is kind of a mystery. I mean, anybody here really understand the Holy Spirit? Like we said, you know, we, uh, when, we, when most of us were kids, the Holy Spirit was called what? Holy Ghost. And like I told you, all I knew was Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> but now we need to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the evidence of the spirits at work is, is filled in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Well, think about this. What turns a person into a bold follower of Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. What can transform a person into a godly person? The Holy Spirit. What can turn a church from average to great? Holy Spirit. What can bring revival? Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is this important, then we ought to be better aware of who the Spirit is. Because when we live under the power and leading, the Holy, leading of the Holy Spirit, we can then live like these disciples. We can live boldly. We can come up and talk to somebody about Jesus. We can, we can live examples in, in the... the um, in the work of the Spirit in our lives. So just kind of a what a maybe a definition would be the Holy Spirit is the presence of God that dwells in each believer. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. The portion of God that dwells in each believer. The Holy Spirit comes when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Something when the Spirit comes in, the Bible refers to baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that process is not meant to be a limited one-time experience, but it is the entrance of God into our lives. Too often we, re we seek to repeat those emotional experiences just for their own sake, because we, we, were, we were moved by them. But that's not the purpose of any experience. It's to move us to ministry. Baptism of the Holy Spirit can be thought of as being immersed in the presence of God. When we're baptized into God's presence, first thing that happens is we're made aware of our sinfulness and how God is so righteous. And it's then that we want to empty ourselves of, our, of this sinfulness and, and seek to live a life that the Holy Spirit empowers. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we can live like Jesus. So there is a difference between receiving the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 in the New Living Translation says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And filled refers to being controlled. So here's the key to living boldly, allowing the Holy Spirit to have more of us. We might think of it this way. We are filled with self when we come to Christ. I mean, let's face it. We are heathens, self-focused, self-centered. And there's no room for the Holy Spirit to work. But as we empty us of us, the Spirit can start working. We start to see changes. 
We begin this emptying process by confessing and repenting of the sin we know about. We, we cannot hold on to that sin and, and have the Holy Spirit work at the same time. It's like mutually exclusive. We need to get rid of the sin and the Holy Spirit helps us do that. We have to stop doing the things that are not what a Christian should be doing. We need to empty ourselves and we can do that when we stop being fearful or petty or vengeful or negative or angry or any of those other things that run counter to what Christ would want. It's, it's when we make a choice to act in a Christ-like way. That's when we are emptying ourselves of ourselves. And this allows the Holy Spirit to work in us. And when we do that, when we make that step of faith to say, okay, I'm not going to live that way anymore. Then we're trusting God through the Holy Spirit to step in and make that be a fruitful experience. We're trusting when we do this that God will guide us through the Holy Spirit. See, it, it boils down to this. Is God first place in your life? First commandment is you have no other gods before me. Now I think if we're all honest, we'd probably say, He's not totally first. But then we need to say, but, but is that the direction I'm aiming? Am I aiming towards God? See, God looks at our direction. Where are we headed? What are we doing? We need to have a steady movement to be more like Jesus, moving in that direction, day by day. And now the evidence will be this. Look at Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those aren't really natural things for us to do, is it? We're not naturally patient. We're not naturally self-controlled. Tad had a children's story a few weeks back about being self-controlled. That's just not us, is it? But the Spirit in us, we'll start seeing these things popping out. We have, we have blackberries and raspberries in our garden, and uh, the raspberries are now forming fruit. The blackberries are really blossoming right now, and they're going to turn into fruit. That's what it is with us. We start seeing those things happen. Because what we do, we live in the aftermath of Pentecost. And, it, and it's lived out each day in the church. That day the church spilled out into the surrounding community. In a little bit we're going to spill out into the community. They couldn't contain themselves. They, they had to get out. They had to talk. They, they spoke in a way that people could understand. And under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to do that as well. We'll be able to say something to somebody and it's going like, oh gee, thank you. I needed to hear that. And, and if you're like me, you'll walk away and go, what, what did I say? <laughs> I, I can't tell you in the 20 some years that I, that I pastored how many times I met with people and, and to think, you know, they were, they were grateful that we had the conversation and I think, what did I say? The Spirit does that. He'll just pour the words out of us. And, and these people were speaking, as we said, in languages, and they were talking about Jesus to people. We're in a time when we need a fresh movement of the Holy Spirit, don't we? This, this world's in a mess. And it needs Jesus so desperately. And, and this is what we're called to do. We're called to leave these doors and go out and spread the name of Jesus in whatever way that maybe we're going to talk about Jesus. Maybe they'll just see us and go, why are you so patient? Why, why do you turn the other cheek? Why do you do this or that? And we just have to say, it's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit in me. See, our message is that with God's Spirit, anything's possible in any church, no matter how big or how small a church is. Everything's possible. Because it doesn't depend on the size of this building, does it? It depends on the size of the God that's in each of us. We are the church. This is the church building. 
I know we say, well, I'm going to church. You know, the church is coming to gather in this building. But our message is that in Jesus who died, who rose from the dead, who ascended, the world can be renewed and restored. The message that the church has is that Jesus is the answer to everything. And, and that when we live by his words, his words are life. You know, he said that we would have an abundant life in him, not in material things. It doesn't mean we're going to get rich, but it means we're going to have peace and purpose. You see, God is in the restoration and renewal business. God can restore life to the lifeless, hope to the hopeless, healing to the brokenhearted. And all he does is ask us to come to him, turn our lives over to him, and we can live boldly and abundantly. So, the aftermath. So what's going to be the aftermath of us being here today? Um, we should always see something happen. So here's, here's your invitation this week. What will you do this week that will allow the Holy Spirit to be more in control of your life? What can you do that will allow the Holy Spirit to be more in control of your life? What will you do this week that will reflect that Jesus is your Savior and Lord? Who will come to know Jesus better because you allowed the Holy Spirit to lead you? And to sum it up, how will you show Jesus to the world? That's our, that's our message today. How will we show Jesus to the world? That day in Jerusalem, the Spirit came upon them because, number one, they did what Jesus said. They went back to Jerusalem, spent 10 days praying. I don't know if it was 10 days solid or what, but that day on the festival of harvest, and 3,000 people were harvested for God's kingdom. Is that a coincidence? No. But something happened, and they spilled out into the streets, and people were saved. So, here's your message. Here's your invitation. Think about, God, what do you want to do in my life this week? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message of Pentecost that... You're always at work. You're always ready to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Help us get out of the way. Help us empty ourselves of ourselves and let you lead us. We want to see great things happen in our midst. And we thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen.